there's a light in the window, table spread in splendor, someone standing by the open door. I can see a crystal river, so I must be near forever, I've never been this homesick before. See the bright lights shine, it's just about home time. I can see my father standing by the door. This world's been a wilderness, I'm ready for deliverance. Lord, I've never been this homesick before. I can see the family gather, sweet faces all familiar, no one old or feeble anymore, this so lonesome heart is crying, think I spread my wings and fly, Lord, I've never been this homesick before, see the bright light shine. It's just about home time I can see my father standing by the door This world's been a wilderness I'm ready for deliverance Lord, I've never been this homesick before I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Genesis. That's the very first book in your Bible, so it's easy to find. And chapter 6. Now here's what we're doing in our Thursday night Bible study. We're walking through the Word of God dispensationally. In other words, God has divided His book, considered as a great big pie, and there's several different pieces in that pie that represent different time periods called dispensations. And that's a Bible word. God uses it. He invented it. I didn't. And nor did any other theologian invent it. That's a God's word, dispensation. So we're walking through the book and just looking at these different dispensations. And so the one that uh, <clears throat> we uh, considered this last Thursday night is called the dispensation of human government. God is the institutor of government. And he 
very quickly recognizes and acknowledges that it can go, uh, it can go askewed, it can go astray, it can lose his uh, boundaries and guidelines, and it always does. And the book of Daniel teaches us that. Government is bound to go belly up. And one reason for that is it's going to continue to do that until the one shows up and the Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's speaking of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we got a little introduction last Thursday night to that dispensation and uh, so what I've purposed to do is, as we go through this thing Thursday night dispensationally, I'm just going to pick various stories or personalities that are represented by that particular dispensation and preach on them on Sunday. So what, what, what uh, in practical language, what I'm trying to do is load up my double barrel and, and give you a, a dose of the doctrine and a dose of the inspiration in connection with that particular dispensation. So we read in Genesis in chapter 6 and verse 11, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breadth of life from under heaven, and everything that is in heaven shall die. Heavenly Father, as we consider the gravity of and the perplexity of these passages. I pray that you will give us some insight and understanding and revelation, not only as to the historical and scientific accuracy and significance of these events, but Lord, help us to see beyond that and what you intended to do as far as the human race is concerned and why you did it. And God, how that may apply to us and the generations in which we live. And we'll thank you for it in the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. I have long found it interesting to notice that the world is always, always, always anxious to use science against the Bible. But never are they anxious to use science to reinforce the Bible or to illustrate the Bible. Then they'll run far, far away from that science. Well, just as a matter of introduction, and we're just going to consider a few things a little bit scientifically, those would say, well, you know, there's no evidence of a universal flood as recorded in the Bible, and that's just a biblical myth, and and, and there's no reality to that whatsoever, and they would uh, fly off to the science of evolution and, and all of the things that all the limbs that grow off that tree and uh, they would point to uh, things, uh, um, minute things in archaeology, et cetera, et cetera, to try to run away from the biblical account of the flood. But the fact of the matter is, there's overwhelming, phenomenal scientific evidence of a great flood exactly as God describes. Three books in particular have been written. The average person will never read them. But nonetheless, three books have been written that approach the whole subject of the flood scientifically and the evidence for it. One is uh, the uh, Biblical Ice Epic and the Flood, by written by Donald Wesley Patton. I think that was uh, 
published in 1966. And then uh, there was an old Lutheran who, uh, his name was Rywinkle, and he wrote a book which is exceptionally good. And that was published back in 1951. And then uh, John Whitcomb and I think his partner, and I forget his name, wrote a book uh, that kind of goes along the same thing and uh, published about 1962. And I found it kind of fascinating that these three books that are just jam-packed full of scientific archaeological information verifying a universal flood came out in the 50s and the 60s. You suppose that's a coincidence? Well, that was just about the time that the intellectual community of the universities of the world decided to really attack the Word of God. And so God, simultaneous to that, said, I've got the correct information scientifically if you want to take the time to read it. I've read all three of those books. And I'll tell you what, they are jammed uh, with with tremendous uh, tremendous information. But let me just rehearse some of it in very brief to you. Number one, consider population. Consider the numbers. Cons- uh, cons- uh, just extrapolate. For example, figuring from 4,000 B.C., and <clears throat> according to uh, those that study these things, numerologists, we can date uh, Adam and Eve back to somewhere approximately 4,000 B.C. So let's move forward from that point. Even though science likes to tell us that is false science, and that's what uh, the Apostle Paul told us to beware of, didn't he? Beware of. He didn't tell you to beware of science. As a matter of fact, uh, Daniel was a scientist. Hezekiah was a scientist. Solomon was a scientist. All in good standing with God, don't you see? But it's false science that God warned us about. Now, false science says, well, mankind has occupied this planet for uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe even as far as millions of years. So if you go back several million years and, and play the numbers, what do you come up with? All right, now you've all done 2 plus 2 is 4, and 4 plus 4 is 8, and 8 plus 8 is 16, and 16 plus 16 is 32, and 64, and you know the deal? And it doesn't take long, and the numbers just keep growing exponentially. They grow and grow and grow fairly quickly. So let's just go back in our experiment mathematically to 4,000 years B.C., Now, without a universal flood, some 1,500 years later after that, but now, don't include a universal flood that wiped out humanity, except for eight that God talks us about, but including wars, pestilence, famines, disease, natural disasters. Do you know what the present population of the earth would be right now, today? Well, as it stands, it's somewhere between six and seven billion, they estimate. But do you know what it would be if we went back to 4,000 years B.C., that's 6,000 years ago, and brought it forward, excluding a flood, but including all the other things that take human lives, the population of the world would be at least 160 billion. Now, folks, that's just mathematics. That's all that is. That's arithmetic. What do you do with that? Secondly, there are ancient records of a universal flood with the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Mexicans, the Chinese, Polynesians, Druids, Malayans, East Africa, India, Alaska, Iceland, and almost every Indian tribe in America has a legend about a universal flood. Now, how is it that all of these various people, and the Assyrians and the Greeks and the Phoenicians and the Egyptians and the Chinese, that all dates back at least 2,000 years B.C.? How is it that these people scattered all over the globe came up with the same story when they had no social intercourse with each other, none whatsoever, just, but they all came up with the story of a universal flood? How's that possible? 
I'm still waiting for the university uh, professor at Harvard to explain that to me. And then we have to consider geology. Geology. Now, here's a term, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you're going to be. And so if you leave church today and say nothing else, I want you to remember you learned something. Here's what you learned. Ociferous fissures. Aren't you excited? You're going to learn what an ociferous fissure is. Well, in geology, an ociferous fissure are crevices at high altitudes containing bones of animals and men intermixed with species that are not normally found together. Now, here's a the bones of a saber-toothed tiger next to a monkey that he would normally eat. And then there's a there's a human skeleton here and huge amounts of all kinds of skeletons and in every single situation they have found these at high altitudes, the highest altitude that was available in that geographic area or district. Now, how is that possible? How would you even describe that? Ociferous fissures. The only description is animal and mankind alike is fleeing a flood, fleeing water. Now, if they were fleeing fire and wind, they wouldn't necessarily go to the highest altitude. But water, that just makes sense. And then there are oil deposits. You know what they found in numerous... And by the way, these ociferous fissures appear on every continent on the planet. Every continent. North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa. They're all over, you see. All right, now, oil deposits... Well, what they found in oil deposits are fish fossils that are packed closely together with extended spines and fins, which are extended only in case of danger and fright. Hmm. Now, why would a fish be frightened in water? Unless it was raining at the tune of six inches per minute. Now, I don't know if Mount Everest existed in that time, and I don't know if it was as high as it is now, but if it did, and if it was, then that's what it would take in 40 days and 40 nights of rain, about six inches per minute to cover Everest. Now, you ain't ever seen a gully washer like that. I'm telling you... And people say, well, where did all that rain come from? Well, that's another sermon. But there is, of course, a very good biblical explanation for that. And then another thing that we have to think about is our polar caps and something we discussed briefly last Thursday night, the axis of the earth. There was a time, evidently, according to scientific investigations that have discovered fossils of what appear to be from a subtropical climate at both the North Pole and in Antarctica. Now, how did they get there? How in the world was it that at one time, at both the North and the South Pole, there was greenery, there was life, as uh, as you would know it at the equator? How is that possible? Well, the only, uh, the only viable explanation is that at one time, the Earth was on a perpendicular axis, straight up and down. But today, that's no longer the case. The axis of the earth that it rotates on is 23 and a half degrees. And that accounts for our seasons as we know them today, you see. And, but is there an explanation for that? I'm glad you ask. <laughs> Let's investigate very briefly. Go to Isaiah in chapter 13. A little Bible searching won't hurt you. It's good for you. Isaiah chapter 13. Now, God is prophetically speaking in Isaiah 13 about something he's going to do, but often of what he is going to do is predicated on what he's already done. In other words, history goes full circle. Now, in Isaiah 
13, and interestingly and quite fascinatingly, verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Do you suppose that God has the ability to shake the world out of its place? Elvis didn't have any idea what he was really talking about when he sang all shook up. (laughs) All right, go to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah 24. Just a little further. Isaiah 24 and verse 18. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake. Fascinating. Do shake. Verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgressions thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Once again, this is prophetic in its nature. But what has taken place, Solomon tells us, is destined to take place again. The next time it won't be the result of the flood. It'll be a result of the hand of God in shaking things up. All shook up, I'll bet you. Now let's look at uh, the historical application. One more passage, Psalms. Psalm, let me see, did I see? Yeah, Psalm, I got to tell myself where I'm going. Psalm 82, Psalm 82. Nothing like a good Bible study to help you out a little bit. Psalm 82. And we studied this very briefly Thursday night, but let's look again at verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Notice little g-o-d-s, plural. And so that relates to uh, Genesis chapter 6. And the sons of God came into the daughters of men, saw that they were fair, and you know the result. All right, now look down here. So the whole context is set in something that's already happened. Verse 5, they know not. Neither will they understand, they walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. All right, that's that's something that's already happened, you see. We have future tense, we have past tense, you see. They're out of course and present tense. In other words, in God's estimation, the very axis of the earth presently is out of course. It's operating on an unnatural situation and pivot. And one day, God's going to straighten it up. And he's going to do that when Jesus returns at the millennial kingdom. But just by virtue of the whole thing and the whole uh, setup, you see, in, in that regard, well, how else do you explain it? And then that's not all. There are alleged, and I say alleged because I believe them to be so, but there are alleged actual sightings of the ark. Now, according to your Bible, when the waters receded, the ark landed on a mountain called Ararat. Ararat is on the Russian-Turkey border. And consequently, the Russians have allowed very, very little access to it. Now, way back in the year 1269, Marco Polo reported seeing the ark. Now, there have been various reports like that over the centuries, because occasionally, and this is, this, this is the, what is thought, the ark rests in a crevasse or a, a big hole up on Mount Ararat somewhere, And generally speaking, it's filled with ice and snow. But on rare occasion, enough of that during a season of particular warmth, enough of that snow and ice is melted where people have actually seen at least a smidgen or a portion of that huge, giant wooden ship in there. Now, in ice and snow, it can be preserved for, you know, Ever and ever. I mean, that's the way that thing works. All right. Now, in 1942, a Russian aviator by the name of Vladimir Roskovitsky. 
He's, you know, R O S K I V I S K S K Y. You know, it's almost always Russian if it ends in S K Y. If it's S K I, it's a it's a Polak. And the reason why most Polish names end in ski is they cannot spell toboggan. (laughs) Being a Polak, I know about that. (laughs) I could not have won a second grade spelling bee in my life. Spelling, oh man, it's just... But anyway, having said that, Vladimir, a Russian aviator, flew over that and he thought he saw something and he circled the wagons in his airplane and flew over it very low again and took photographs of it. All right, Mr. Baldwin says he's seen the photographs. The Russian government keeps most of that under tight security, don't you see, because the actual story of a real flood, as indicated in the in the Bible, would not uh, be well attuned to communism, uh, which denies God. Now, there have been several others over the years, and there have been expeditions that have actually been launched up to try to find the ark, and um, most of them have been met with uh, uh, various difficulties and never got there, but uh, there have been some. Now, Let me uh, digress momentarily and say this. Jesus said a very fascinating thing. In biblical prophecy, he said, As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus indicated that just prior to his second advent, things are going to be very, very similar to the way they were in the days of Noah. When violence encompassed the earth, when immorality and wicked imaginations were the code of the day. But what else took place in the days of Noah? The population saw the ark. They saw the physical ark. So it has long been my impression that one day, God says, Al Gore, it's your turn. Global warming. (laughs) And that thing's going to melt enough to expose that ark so that humanity is going to see the actual biblical evidence of it. And then it occurred to me as I was pondering this whole thing this week, I said, but wait. For 1995, there's more. But wait. We already have one in northern Kentucky. They built one. And it is an incredible thing to see and to witness. We've been there. We've toured it. And so, if nothing else, we can say, there is an ark, and once you tour that ark and get a a, a, a real perspective of the whole thing, it, it just really calms down all criticisms of the biblical narrative of the whole thing. But I believe the real ark is going to be exposed, and God purposely has that thing encased in snow and ice until the appropriate day. And then, I mean, there'll be satellites that are flying all over this globe that'll say, there it is, there it is, there it is. Now, will it make any difference in the minds of those who imaginations are continually evil? Probably not. But God will say, there it is. Look at that thing right there. Now, many questions have been raised in trying to negate the the actual credibility of the story. One of the most common questions is, well, how did Noah get all those animals into the boat? I mean, there's lots and lots of animals. All right, now, first of all, let's consider the size of the boat. The actual size was approximately 600 foot long. Folks, that's two football fields. 600 foot long, 
125 foot wide and 75 foot high. It was three stories. That is 5,685,000 cubic feet. Now get a load of this. A railroad car can hold 20 cattle, 60 to 80 hogs, 80 to 100 sheep. 1,000 railroad cars could have been placed in that ark. That's not all. Let's stick to science. Science has all the answers. There are only 290 species of animals in this entire world above the size of a sheep. That's all. Just 290 species of animals that are bigger than a sheep. There are 757 species of animals between the size of a sheep and a rat. There are 1,359 that are smaller. So you average all those animals, and the average size is that of a house cat. Do you think it's such a big problem? You think God didn't have all this figured out? Do you know that 60% of all living things are insects? That's a precious thought. (laughs) And 30% are fish or other things that live in the water. So do you really, really, really believe that that was such a big difficulty? I don't think so. And, of course, God certainly has the ability to put within all of those animals, all those species, all those critters, the desire to show up and position themselves in the ark. He has that ability, of course. So that leads us to really the last and maybe most critical question, and that is, why is it that humanity is so eager to discount the flood in the ark? Why is it that they will purposely ignore volumes of science? Why do you suppose that they are willingly ignorant? Wouldn't you think that the chiefest universities of the land that are interested in nothing but pure science and constant investigation, wouldn't you think that they would be there mounting uh, just expedition after expedition? Wouldn't they be beseeching the Russian government daily for another expedition up that uh, mountain to see if they could find it? Wouldn't you think that satellite pictures would be taken continuously, seeing if they could see even the smallest shred of evidence? Wouldn't you think so? But not so at all. What they've done is they've said, well, we'll just ignore it and brush it under the rug. Wouldn't you think that uh, they would want that kind of information, even the remotest possibility of it, to be taught in every classroom and every public school in America? There must be a reason, a very prevailing reason, as to why humankind is so eager to discount the entire story. Well, first of all, let's go back to Genesis 6. Genesis in chapter 6. And of course, this is right in the beginning, the initiation of this whole narrative that we have about the flood. And verse 5, Genesis 6, 5, and God saw. Do you know that God sees? And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How many of you have thought or said or both in recent days or months even as you look at the social inclinations of just America and thought, can it get any worse? Well, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And God said, you know what? I see what's going on. 
Look in chapter 8 and verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So one reason why this is so readily discounted is because the flood is a vivid, technicolor demonstration of the sin of mankind. It demonstrates very, very clearly the necessity of it because of sin. Well, what did the prophets have to say about it? I've got about half a dozen verses I want you to look at. You know I want you to look at them? Sometimes you can just kind of glibly let them run off your tongue and people say ho-hum, but we need to allow these very pointed, two-edged sword scriptures to pierce our own minds and hearts. Look with me in Isaiah in chapter 5. Let's see what the prophets had to say. Isaiah chapter 5. Because every one of these will shed a little more light on the insanity and sinfulness of the human race. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. (laughs) Well, that describes an awful lot of what's transpired in, in our world and even in our nation over the last few decades, does it not? That which is evil, they have every... Every, every way in the world are calling it good. And that which is good, they call it evil. All right, let's go to Jeremiah. Next book, Jeremiah and chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 22. For my people. Now, when God says in Jeremiah, my people, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about the Jewish people. He's not even talking about the Gentiles. God knows they were in a mess. So he's talking about his own people, Israel. And he says, for my people is foolish. They've not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. If that was the condition of Israel that had all the advantages of the word of God and God's leading and God's deliverance and God's care, then what do you suppose the condition of the Gentile nations were? It was a wreck. Do you not think so? I wonder what Jesus had to say about it. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. The more we investigate these verses, the more we begin to see, oh yeah, what the flood proves, if it doesn't prove anything else, it proved the evil imaginations of the human race. And who wants to admit to that if you're just planning on earning your salvation? If you're planning on your righteousness and your good works somehow ushering you through the pearly gates. How does, how does that fly? See, that doesn't fly very good. But God continues to extend the warnings. In, in uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11. If ye then being evil. Now the ye in the verse is addressed to the most religious people on the planet. The Pharisees. The Jewish uh, uh, Pharisees. If ye then being evil. Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? But in the estimation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the religious crowd that he was uh, preaching to at this time was evil. And he called them that. He said, you're evil. (laughs) Who wants to be called evil? I mean, really. Well, I wonder what Paul had to say about it. Go with me to Romans in chapter 3.
Nowhere, anywhere in your entire Bible can you find one passage that suggests that the human race is innately good. Quite to the contrary. Nowhere does it say we are good. (laughs) Now the Apostle Paul, being who he is, said this in Romans in chapter 3 and verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None and no, that means exactly what you know they mean. And then in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that's Paul's estimation of the human race. And then along with that, he has a lot of other things to say. For example, in Romans 3.18, he says there's something wrong with your eyes. In Romans 3.14, he says there's something wrong with your mouth. In verse 13, he says there's something wrong with your tongue, you see. I mean, in... Uh, in verse 15, he says there's something wrong with your feet. And in verse 16, he says there's something wrong with your ways. I mean, he covers in the whole gamut right there. There's something wrong with us. You're just wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, who wants to hear that? Particularly if they are priding themselves in their own self-righteousness. So consequently, anything that would suggest the necessity of the destruction of evil imaginations that has circumferenced the entire human race must be ignored or better yet, eliminated. So there's the story of the flood. And so a lot of other stories like that of supernatural proportions are treated that way in your Bible. For example, Jonah and the the whale. You know, the student was in the classroom. Let me see if I can remember this story straight. And the teacher said, who was a bit of a a critic of the Word of God, uh, somehow Jonah and the whale came up as a subject. And and, uh, the student said, well, Jonah got swallowed by a whale. And the teacher said, well, That's not right, Johnny. Everybody knows the whale's throat is not big enough to swallow a human being. That's not right. That's just a myth. And Johnny said, well, you know, that's just what the Bible says, that uh, that Jonah got swallowed by the whale. And uh, she said, well, that's that's not right. And she said, well, let's just suppose that uh, your story um, is true. What do you think happened to Jonah? Well... Johnny said, the Bible says he went to hell. But then later, the, the, the whale got on the beach and vomited him out. And then later, he went to heaven. She said rather sarcastically, well, how do you know he's not still in hell? And Johnny said, well, if he is, you can check with him later. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It was a story like that. I couldn't remember exactly how it went, so I had to make it up as I went, you know. It's a, but you got the point. You got the point. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, what did John the Baptist have to say? Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. The only way in your Bible, the only way that you can find God speaking well of the human race or individuals of humanity is after conversion. He'll speak well of you once you've received the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he will speak so well of you that he'll call you his child. Wow. Wow. He'll use wonderful words like redeemed, sanctified, saved, born again, treasures in heaven. I mean, that's all yours, you see. Once you've trusted the same, prior to that, he's got nothing good to say about you. Like it or lump it, folks. Suck it up, snowflake. That's the way it is. In uh, in uh, Luke in chapter 3, 
And uh, verse 7, John the Baptist has something to add to this. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of lovely folks. <laughs> oh, no, he said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, I don't know anyone that really appreciates being called a snake. And not only a snake, but a viper, biblically speaking, is a poisonous one. You see, so uh, that, that, that's, you know, John had such an appealing approach. John just had nothing but good things to say about folks. Not. Not. One more, Second Peter in chapter 2. Let's allow our friend Peter to put the exclamation mark on the spiritual condition of the human race. In Second Peter in chapter 2. Here's part of the description. It's only a portion of it. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. What a lovely, lovely summary right there. So, People are eager to discount the flood and the ark and all of the narrative that it occupies. Why? Because it proves the depraved condition of the human race. But that's not all. It also proves that God will judge sin. The holiness of God's character is borne out in the whole story of the flood. God will judge sin. There is a time appointed unto men to die, and after this, the judgment. Because of God's absolute holiness, his absolute absence of sin in his character, his flawless integrity, he has no choice. He has no alternative except to judge sin. His very character demands it. His very being says it must be so, you see. And so he will judge as he did in that day and as he has periodically over the centuries and as he will again, as he will not only for nations, but he will for individuals. You see, God must judge sin. And then it demonstrates something else. It demonstrates a tremendous principle, and the principle is, as we study the story in Genesis, you know, God said, okay, open the door, let all these critters in, Noah, you and your family come in, and so Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, eight people, Peter tells us, went into the ark, and uh, there they abode and waited for the rain to come. All right, now, the rain came. And don't you know when it was about uh, three to four foot high and coming down six inches a minute that there were multitudes of people knocking on the door. Let us in. Noah, please let us in. Let us in. It's the same crowd that Noah had preached to, the Bible says, for 120 years. He had preached faithfully. He would preached the message of repentance. He preached the message of God's forgiveness based on repentance and trusting what God said. <clears throat> and don't you know they're beating on the door? They're trying every way in the world to get in and there's no access whatsoever. And here's the reason why there was no access. The Bible says it was God that shut the door. Now when God shuts the door, the door is shut. The door is shut tight. And no man can open the door that God himself has shut. And so it demonstrates a principle of God shutting the door. Now, what that tells me is opportunities are limited. Perhaps you're here this very day. And you've pondered, you've considered, you've tinkered around with the notion of receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you haven't done it. 
and you've procrastinated and you've put it off and said another time, another day, I'll think about it a little longer. There's some more things that I want to take care of. What could you possibly be taking care of that's more important than the preservation of your own soul? What could you possibly be doing that's more important than that? Beware, my friend, lest God shuts the door. And the opportunity is extinguished like a vapor. Beware, God shut the door. There are some who have procrastinated to the point that they got to the place where they said, well, maybe, maybe not, and all of a sudden the door was shut. Our friend Miguel went home to heaven this week. I doubt that he was expecting to go. But he did. But the good news is, the very good news is, the door was open. Because... He took the opportunity and advantage of walking through the open door a long time ago and trusted Jesus. And he was never afraid to brag on Jesus. You know, when folks are willing to brag on Jesus, you pretty well know that they know him, that they've trusted him. He walked through the door when the door was made available. Have you walked through the door? And then I have one last thing. The flood demonstrates the incapacities of the human heart for righteousness. It proves God will judge sin. It demonstrates the principle of God shutting the door. And finally, it points to one way. There weren't two arcs. There was just one. Well, I believe there's many ways to heaven, preacher. You're an idiot. <laughs> Forgive me, but you are. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Well, I believe as long as folks are sincere. Do you know that this town is full of drunks that are sincere? They're sincerely drunk. No, sincerity has nothing to do with it. Is it possible to be sincerely wrong? There's just one way. There's just one way, that's all. Not two, not three, just one door. Jesus declared himself to be that door. And God endorsed that declaration over and over and over again and continues to do so to this day. Now, we still have natural catastrophes. We have floods, but not universal in scope. We have famine. We have drought. We have earthquakes. We have tidal waves. We have all kinds of natural disasters. We have hurricanes. We have tornadoes. Do you know what all these natural disasters really are? They're a wake-up call. They're a wake-up call. That's God just saying, hey, look at my capability. Look what I can do. How much trouble do you suppose it is for God to send a a hundred-mile-long tornado like he recently did in the Midwest? Do you think that's any big deal for God? And why would God even be interested in doing a thing like that? Well, number one, we know the earth is under a present curse, and we know that that's just a manifestation of the curse. But God utilizes those things as a wake-up call. There was a man in Washington State when I pastored there that his family had gotten saved and in our church and involved, and it was it was good to see him there. And it was good folks, good folks. They trusted the Lord, and it was it was a blessing. But the dad, he just resisted and rejected, and I visited with him periodically about his soul. I sat down in his kitchen table with him and opened the scriptures and showed him how he needed to be saved. 
Well, I'll think about it another time, preacher, another time. And lo and behold, we had what was called the Nisqually earthquake. It's, I've been in a handful of real minor earthquakes in Southern California, but I've never been in one like that. All of a sudden, I heard this rumble. I was downstairs in my office, and I thought it was Linda upstairs in the bedroom with the vacuum cleaner that went cuckoo, you know? And all of a sudden, the rumble increased, and I looked out the window across our pasture, and the ground was rolling in waves. And it sounded, I'd heard it before, but now, then I heard it with my own ears, it sounded like a freight train in our living room. And man, oh man, I said, whoo. I yelled at Linda at the top of my lungs. I said, get down here. Let's get outside. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we dashed outside and stood on the front porch and then out on the lawn as we watched the ground just going in ripples like that. Well, we were very fortunate. We suffered very little damage, just a little here and there, but nothing of any great consequence. We had pictures falling off the walls and things falling off the mantle, you know, and things like that. But nothing, fortunately, of any great consequence. The epicenter was in a place called Nisqually, which wasn't really all that far from where we live. Maybe it's a crow flies, I don't know, 15 miles. Um, but what was interesting is that night, that very night, that man that I'd been dealing with, called me up. He said, Preacher, we need to talk. I said, Yes, we do. And he got saved. He trusted the Lord Jesus. He was at least smart enough to listen to the wake-up call. What's it going to take for you? What's going to wake you up? He said, well, I've already woken up. I've trusted the Savior. Amen. Good for you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But if you haven't, what's it going to take? Don't doubt God's word. He's right on target. Let's stand for prayer.